Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different. Instead of talking about one particular paper, I'm going to talk about 34. This was a literature review that I wrote quite a while back on unconventional gas oil ratios, or GOR, in the industry. And today I'll talk about that literature review. Before we get to the content, please be sure to like this video, subscribe so you can get more content in oil and gas and professional development topics, and please be sure to comment on the video, comment below, so I can incorporate your feedback into future videos. I hope you enjoy the content and let's get to it. Good afternoon, my name is Yogashri Pradhan and I'll cover a compiled summary of observed gas oil ratio trends in liquids rich shale reservoirs. And I'm mostly focusing on black oil reservoirs when it comes to liquids rich shales. I'll first start with the fundamentals of documented trends, well-known trends in the industry, and I've broken this down into three parts. For instance, your early GOR is constant at initial solution GOR, while the flowing bottom hole pressure is above bubble point. Your GOR rises when the flowing BHP goes below bubble point, and your transient GOR plateaus, which is characteristic of linear flow. I'll now have us pay attention to two charts on the right of the slide where one study that came from Koshkadam just shows the flattening of your flowing bottom hole pressure as well as your GOR because this flowing bottom hole pressure has not reached below bubble point. And some of these plots come from your numerical simulations of your unconventional reservoirs where your flowing bottom hole pressure strongly depends on, or your GOR strongly depends on your flowing bottom hole pressures. And most of this, especially the three components, has been covered by a study from Newfield from three years ago. I'll first talk about the physical mechanisms behind these GOR trends. For instance, your thermodynamic phase behavior and fluid and rock interaction are still not well understood, and there's some contributors to this nonlinearity that Koshkadam has published in his work. For instance, there's PVT property suppression, there's pressure-dependent permeability and compaction, and there's critical gas saturation changes. And while it's been documented that GOR has strongly been a function of flowing bottom hole pressure, there are other components as well, such as your fracture geometry, gas and oil PVT properties, and gas oil rel perm curves. And that came from Whitston from NTNU. Finally, your suppressed bubble points and flat GOR trends at early time. This can come from your confined and mid-confined nanopores, nanopore proximity on the fluid, rock, and transport properties, and capillary pressure changes. While they might be negligible, the, this might not be negligible because the pore sizes are in tens, and th tens of nanometers. That's the exception, and that decreases the bubble point pressure as well. This came from Nojebe. I'll first talk about the expected trends that come from our simulations and from some of the empirical models that we use to forecast our well performance. For instance, your GOR provides an inverse relationship to the recovery factor in liquids rich shale reservoirs, and the recovery factor above bubble point is sensitive to your GOR, which could range between three to five and a half percent. Modified hyperbolic and transient hyperbolic models are actually appropriate decline curve analysis models, according to Koshkadan. And the justification behind using these models would be you would use different ARPS parameters to represent your flow regimes. And that's represented in the chart over here where you have your transient hyperbolic model, you have your modified hyperbolic superimposed on the historical data, proving that you can predict your well performance or your GOR trends using these empirical models. I'll now discuss your actual trends and I'll cover a couple case studies in the Permian Basin. For instance, the reason the significance behind these observed trends versus what's been modeled is that increasing GORs in, due to depletion below the bubble point they're indicative of sharper oil production decline than originally forecasted in actual GOR trends and unconventional plays, which has been a topic of discussion, especially recently. And one example is that Sharma from Enveris, they show in their study for GORs is clear impact on the terminal declines in the middle Bakken. 
I'm going to cover a different study from Enveris, which is the Delaware Basin Wolf Camp A, was, was presented at this conference a couple of years ago. And there's two charts that just represent your GOR versus your cumulative oil. So your GOR is in the right axis or in the right axis and your cumulative oil is in the X axis. All of these data just represents each well data and when they've reached your, their bubble point. The circle just represents that there's a sudden inflection in your GOR trends, which indicates that these wells have really reached below bubble point. Now, the chart on the right rep is the same as the chart on the left, except these wells are binned based upon their vintage, and the data points represent the average GOR based upon the average cumulative oil. In this takeaway, grouping by the vintage gave us a clear view in that your average GOR increased, but it didn't seem to go below bubble point or your bubble point pressure compared to older wells. And the takeaway from this study is that your older wells could have had a higher drawdown to reach bubble point at earlier times compared to your, your, your newer vintage and even including your infill wells. Some additional components to take into consideration from this Inveris study is that wells with higher GORs came from portions of a studied area with higher solution GORs. And the study of the basin covered GOR trends that were increasing from east to west of the Delaware Basin. The increasing GORs are a function of your geothermal gradient, your TOC, your maturity, operational strategy, and your completion designs. And as I mentioned or insinuated before, that there wasn't a clear indica indication of interference between your primary and your infill wells, but it, it, that affected the GORs of the infills. So while there is a prediction that depletion could influence your, your, your GOR trends for your infills, in this particular study, there wasn't a clear trend. I'll now cover another case study, which is in the Southern Midland Basin of Wolf Camp B. This is actually on university lands covering a large part or covering about five counties and it's known, and this area is known as Area 4. Area 4 is divided into three parts due to the well performances, cum GORs. As you go eastward, those GORs increase, and this is color, and each well is color coded based upon this chart on the top right over here, showing the heterogeneity of this area. Some of the observations that came from this case study or from these, from the observed well performance is that the western portion of area four was speculated to lie in an oil rich trend in the southern Midland Basin, which is having lower maturation compared to the rest of Area 4 as you go eastward. The southeastern portion of Area 4 is speculated to have poor reservoir quality and gas migration going eastward, so that's along the Big Lake Fault. And the primary concern for all of the Southern Midland Basin is that bubble point pressure is closer to the reservoir pressure. Therefore, drawdown strategies is critical to future development and well, these wells are sensitive to rising GORs, especially earlier in the production life. And that was covered in some of the work that I've done when evaluating underperforming wells on university lands. Finally, geology is a critical driver for varying GOR trends in Area 4, and it reinforces that drawdown strategies will affect the long-term well performance and GOR rise. I'll now cover the PBT properties that ought to be taken into consideration when observing GOR trends. And Whitston explains some of the best practices when collecting PBT data to come to clear conclusions for GOR trends. For instance, collecting separator samples early with low drawdowns to best simulate in-situ conditions, combining advanced PBT modeling with single well reservoir simulation to match production performance, using fluid initialization parameters as key history matching variables. The black oil reservoir simulation can be used to reliably model single well performance and PBT tables should be, generation, should be generated from your EOS. And one part to caveat with is that black oil tables should include extrapolated saturated properties out to a critical condition. And finally, we must understand a well stream's composition over time, since gas can easily break out of solution at the surface and at the separator. We can normalize for changing separator conditions, since separator conditions vary considerably over time. And of course, knowing a well stream's composition over time can help normalize the GOR to get a better understanding of these trends. 
I'll now cover another extensive study on the importance of fluid sampling. This came from mail from University of Texas in which they collected fluid samples from the Permian Basin, the Bakken and the Three Forks and the Eagleford. The UT collected 10,000 Permian Basin, 12,000 Bakken and Three Forks and 10,000 Eagleford wells for fluid sampling. And the trends are shown on the right over here, where orange represents the Eagleford, blue represents the Bakken and green represents the Permian. The Eagleford and the Permian, so the orange and the green, the GOR starts at around 2,000 SCF per barrel and increases at about 3,000 to 4,000 over the first three years before stabilizing. And the Bakken's GOR, however, so the one in the blue, averages at 1,000 1, SCF per SCB and remains relatively constant. And an explanation behind this is that consistent pore size changes within the source rock maintains undersaturation. There's also been extensive reservoir simulation efforts and best practices documented for GOR trend predictions. One of the best practices is that RTA is appropriate to choose as initial values for matrix and enhanced zones from Koshkadam. And then another caveat for these extensive efforts is that confined and mid-confined phase behavior effects are from nanopore, mesopore, and macropore diameters, giving a suppressed bubble point trend that ought to be included into the model to give a flatter or to represent the flatter GOR trend in, or in later time. Other efforts that have been made are the triple porosity and simplified SRV models. So this was used to represent the pore size distribution for flatter GORs over a longer time period. And that's shown in these charts above where the chart on the left represents your SRV model in blue and your triple porosity model in green, and that how it closely matches to the historical data. And same with your GOR trends over time. The significance of this is not just the nanopore and mesopore or the pore size distributions, but also the inclusion of rock compaction to represent the physics to, to show the flattened GOR trends over time. For common reservoir models and their justifications to consider other models, Ding et al. discusses how the single porosity and dual porosity models don't characterize GOR trends. For instance, they don't take into account long transient flow periods from the matrix to the fracture. The single porosity models don't account the effect of pore size and gas oil capillary pressure distributions on oil and gas production. Dual porosity models with matrix capillary pressure distribution with varying mean values will predict higher cum gas. And finally, the enhanced discrete fracture modeling approach provides appropriate matches while honoring the subsurface physics. So that corrects some of the limitations that the single and the dual porosity model have. I'll now talk about rel perm measurements and their importance. Chatri from ExxonMobil demonstrates their Midland Basin case study on the importance of developing unique rel perm curves in all three phases because that better characterizes the history match and forecast despite varying fracture parameters. And the flow of oil, gas, and water in the rock matrix is driven by these rel perm functions. While we do use our fundamentals from conventional reservoirs for our rel perm curves, these Cori functions are not always appropriate to represent the flattening trend of your, of your GORs at earlier times. I'll now talk about the pore size distribution effects as I've insinuated before with reservoir modeling efforts. Luo et al. from 2018 presented a study on the effect of pore size distribution on the phase behavior of shale reservoir fluids in a multi-scale pore system. The first bubble point pressure forms in fractures and macropores when the nanopores remain undersaturated. The apparent bubble point pressure of fluids depends on the compositional distributions between the bulk region and nanopores. And then above the apparent bubble point pressure, reservoir fluids in all regions are liquid. The bulk region is black oil, and then there's some volatile oil in five nanometer confinement. There's a near critical scenario, and that's induced by a small scale nano confinement effect. And when the pressure falls below the apparent bubble point, 
The gas phase expands within the bulk region and fluids remain liquids in the nanopores throughout depletion with nine nanometer pores releasing light ends and absorbing the heavy ends. Luo also presented a study a year later on the practical framework to incorporate nanopores in a compositional simulation. And there's, for the fluid depletion, that there's two levels of heterogeneity. There's a compositional and a saturation heterogeneity. The saturation heterogeneity talks about the multi-scale fluid phase behavior and that the gas phase only exists in the bulk region, macropores and fractures, while the fluid in the nanopores remains in other saturated liquid. The GOR is higher than normal with nanopores, and the fluid in multi-scale shale matrix depletes at a higher GOR than that of conventional bulk fluid. The GOR fluctuations are observed and found in association with a certain drainage area falling below bubble point. The hydraulic fracture area falls below bubble point first, and it gives an early GOR spike. Then in the later period, the reservoir matrix away from the fractures drops below bubble point. That's causing GOR to rise again and staying at a higher than normal level. And this is actually similar to the industry observations that I talked at the very beginning of this presentation from Newfield. More of this is discussed in the paper. However, I'll talk about other considerations for observing GOR trends, but most of these would be out of the scope of the paper as you go more into more, more in depth with each topic. For instance, predicting your TOC and thermal maturity to determine GOR trends. There's a multi-scale model that could represent the system that is a fractured shale reservoir. For instance, pressure decline yields leaner gas in the bulk region. Intermediate and heavy components remain trapped in the confined region. Lighter ends approach less by pressure regions or fractured volume, and gas is more prone to break out of solution in this region. GORs are most impacted by large pressure gradients in the near frac and near wellbore regions. High pressure gradients cause gas to break out of solution at the sand phase, and fluids away from the wellbore could remain above bubble point pressure for longer time periods. There's also capillary pressure efforts ought to be included simultaneously in a compositionally extended black oil reservoir. And that highlights the importance of measuring the interfacial tension and pore size reductions with pressure as both of these could affect capillary pressure on saturation pressures, phase densities, and viscosities. That also came from Nojibay. And finally, nanopores and the mineralogical content affect the phase shift at different temperatures and pressures. The confinement of the liquid phase is stronger in calcite models, which came from Jin and Nasrabadi from Texas A&M University. I'll now cover the conclusions for this presentation for other components or the main components to focus on of these observed GOR trends in liquid rich shales. First, the bubble point suppression is observed and that's caused by capillary pressure effects in the mid-confined nanopores. However, the acceleration to deplete the reservoir below bubble point is also observed through aggressive drawdown strategies. Factors that affect GOR trends are not just your flowing bottom hole pressure or your drawdown strategies, but also PVT property suppression pressure dependent permeability and changes of critical gas saturation, fracture geometry, pore size distributions, and gas oil rel perm curves. And despite differences in GOR trends between unconventional and conventional reservoirs, the industry will continue to use the modified hyperbolic as this still matches the empirical data well. Modeling techniques ought to have varied pore size distributions capillary pressure and defined matrix and enhanced permeability zones as to provide a comprehensive context on GOR. And finally, with abnormal trends in GORs, the drainage area and pore sizes ought to be taken into consideration. More drainage area means that nanopores from the shale matrix will deplete, which increases GORs. And that explains some of the limitations that even the dual porosity model has. That concludes my presentation. Does anyone have any questions?
And that's a wrap, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that presentation that I gave last year. As usual, please be sure to like this video, subscribe so you can get more content in oil and gas and professional development topics, and please be sure to comment on the video so I can incorporate your feedback into future videos. I upload every Friday and every Sunday, so hit that notification bell when you subscribe. Every Friday is a professional development topic, and every Sunday is a technical review, such as this video. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video once again, and I'll see you in the next one.